What if I told you that part of the root cause of your drinking problem can be traced to something that you've never considered before? It's a small but powerful structure deep inside of your brain, controlling your behavior without you even realizing it. Its job is to process negative emotions like fear and anxiety, and it does this very well. However, when you throw heavy drinking into the mix, the result can be a massive short circuit, and the consequences are absolutely devastating. But there is still hope. By understanding how this structure works and how alcohol affects it, you can take control of your drinking and overcome this addiction. So if you're ready to take the first step towards a healthier, happier life, stay tuned. And just before we get into the video, if you want to get access to a free video training that shows you how to get immediate control of your drinking in a completely different way, please go ahead and click the link in the description. You'll put your name and email address in and then a new video will start playing that really shows you about this reframing process. It's the best video that we've ever made. So make sure to click on that after watching this video. So you're probably wondering, what exactly am I talking about? Well, it's something called the amygdala. So what exactly is this amygdala and where does it get its funny name from? Well, the full scientific name is corpus amygdaloidium, and it's a small mass of brain cells located in a part of your brain called the temporal lobe. You get two amygdalas, one on either side of the brain. Now, I may pronounce this incorrectly, but the name comes from the Greek word for almond, amygdalo on account of its shape. Now, among its various functions, the amygdala is critical in processing emotions like fear and anxiety, as well as responding appropriately to threats in our environment. It's also key to the formation of memories, processing social information, learning, and decision-making. Without the amygdala, your emotional world would be, well, very messed up. I'll come back to this in a minute. An interesting question is how can such a small structure have such a wide range of tasks? Well, the answer is interconnectedness. The amygdala is extensively connected to the rest of the brain. For starters, it receives inputs from all the other brain regions connected to the five senses. So information on what you see, hear, feel, smell, this is all fed into the amygdala. It's also connected to several regions of the brain involved in cognitive processing, such as the prefrontal cortex, which plays a role in decision-making as well as input control. The prefrontal cortex sits right behind your forehead, and it's kind of like the CEO part of the brain. It's where the planning and problem solving that you apply in your daily life takes place. Having received its input from all the parts of the brain, the amygdala then processes it and then sends its output to various other brain regions. These regions are involved in cognitive processes, emotional states, as well as your body's autonomic and physiological reactions. Often when discussing brain structures like the amygdala, rather than telling you exactly what it does, it's a lot more helpful to describe what happens when you don't have it. Now, whilst rare, there are some people without a functioning amygdala. This can happen by way of stroke, for example, through traumatic brain injury, surgical removal, or some rare diseases. A distinctive characteristic of these people is their inability to properly process fear. On a purely rational cognitive level, they understand that a situation is dangerous, but then they cannot develop the appropriate emotional and bodily response to the situation. They're not compelled to run away for their life, as it were. Now, as a consequence, they can repeatedly find themselves in very dangerous and even life-threatening situations. For example, a woman with damage to both her amygdalas was reported a few years back. To not be at all frightened by such things as snakes, spiders, or other stimuli that would normally freak people out. Now, while understanding that her reaction was not normal, she simply could not bring herself to feel fear. So as a result, she repeatedly found herself in life-threatening situations, including being held at gunpoint and nearly dying during a domestic incident. Now, because alcohol is a neurotoxin, heavy drinking over a sustained period of time can lead to a massive number of brain cells simply dying off. Now, this dying off eventually reaches proportions where you can use imaging technologies to measure it, for example, PET scans. Amongst the many regions that do shrink over time, one of them is the amygdala. And for reasons that we'll look at later in the video, the degree to which the amygdala shrinks is intimately linked to drinkers' long-term prospects for sobriety. A seminal 2008 study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry recruited 51 heavy drinkers who were in a three-week inpatient detox program. These people had been abstinent for a week. There was a control group of 52 people without a drinking problem matched for age and education. The researchers recorded that the heavy drinkers reported cravings on a scale of 1 to 10 and then scanned their brain with an MRI. 
We call all these measurements baseline. They are the starting point of the research. And this was just when the participants had stopped drinking. The participants were then followed up for another six months in order to determine who had stayed abstinent and who had relapsed. Now, this wasn't just a matter of asking them and taking their word for it. The researchers took blood and breath tests and also spoke to relatives. Of the 51 individuals, 31 had relapsed and 17 had remained abstinent. We'll call them relapsers and abstainers, respectively. For the remaining three patients, it wasn't possible to determine their status. Now, the beauty and strength of their research is that it was prospective. All too often in this field, researchers take a group of drinkers long after detox and try to work out what happened by going back in time. But good luck trying to collect reliable data by going back in time. So here, the researchers took the group of drinkers from the start right as they were starting their detox. And they ran all sorts of measurements, let each patient run their course, and then they went back again to see which of the parameters they had recorded could explain the differences. Well, turns out that the levels of depression and anxiety were not significantly different at baseline between relapses and abstainers, which is quite interesting. In other words, measuring the anxiety of depression levels of a detoxing heavy drinker does not predict if they'll relapse or stay sober. But there were two baseline measurements that predicted who would relapse and they do so with stunning accuracy. The first was the intensity of craving for alcohol. Relapsers had significantly higher intensity of cravings at baseline compared to abstainers. Abstainers' craving levels were actually so low as to not be significantly different from the healthy control group. The second baseline measurement that predicted relapse, believe it or not, was the volume of the amygdala. Within this group of heavy drinkers, those who subsequently relapsed had smaller amygdala volume compared to the abstainers. Actually, on average, the amygdala volume of abstainers was not not different from that of the healthy controls. In other words, these heavy drinkers had managed to go on drinking for many years without actually shrinking their amygdala, for reasons that are not clear at this point. Now, on the other hand, abstainers were not spared shrinkage of certain other brain regions that are involved in addiction notably the hippocampus and the ventral striatum. Their hippocampus and ventral striatum had shrunk on average just as much as the relapses. So the results strongly suggested that the amygdala and the amygdala alone was the key brain structure that separated relapses from abstainers. Now, going back to the group of relapses, the results also suggested that the amygdala was the brain structure underlying their increased cravings. Within this group of relapses, smaller alcohol volume was correlated with increased alcohol craving. In other words, among the relapses only, the smaller the amygdala, the more intense the cravings at baseline. Among abstainers, however, there was no correlation. Now, I have linked to the paper in the description below. It's quite rare in the field of neuroscience and addiction that you get such clear-cut black and white results as in this study. And if you have the time, I highly recommend that you give it a read. So, in the years that followed, other researchers made similar discoveries about structural changes to the amygdala, its relation to craving, and relapse for various other substances. And these included marijuana, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Researchers also found that the amygdala is heavily involved in the cravings of nicotine-addicted smokers. Now, if you dive into the scientific literature of addiction, one of the core concepts is that of the cue. You'll see this term everywhere. Neuroscientists, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, counselors, everybody who researches the field of addiction talks about cues that can trigger relapse. So the concept of cues is very simple. It's anything in a substance user's environment that has been historically associated with their drug use. For a heroin user, be it current or former, some of these cues can be going to places, going to buildings where they used to use, or a song that they like to play when using the drug, or even bumping into another heroin user in the street. For a smoker, it could be having a pint of beer or smelling somebody else's smoke. And for a drinker, it could be having a cigarette, seeing alcoholic drinks on a restaurant menu, being around other people who drink, feeling stressed, or maybe attending a social gathering like a birthday. And it can even be something as simple as a packet of crisps. Or in America, potato chips. Well, it seems that regardless of which particular addictive substance that you're looking at, whenever a drug user encounters one of these cues in their environment, the amygdala is triggered. The amygdala then assigns to the cue an abnormal emotional value that to a non-drug user is basically incomprehensible. Now, do you remember the lady that we were discussing earlier who had both her amygdalas completely damaged? Well, on a purely rational cognitive level, she understood that her emotional reaction to fear-related stimuli was dysfunctional, but she just couldn't bring herself to react in an emotionally appropriate way. Well, broadly speaking, it seems like the amygdala does the same with cues related to drug use. Remember, it's well connected to all five senses in your brain. So it doesn't matter if you hear the cue, smell it, taste it, feel it, the amygdala will know. And then it will trigger an abnormal emotional reaction to stimuli that would be insignificant to a non-drug user. And the result will sadly often be 
relapse. Especially if an individual is using something like willpower or maybe replacing the drug with other rewards. Anyway, if you click the video on the screen now, you can learn why a drinking problem exists with a new system to gain control.